I recently had a chance to sit down with Professor Richard Dawkins. We discussed the nature of genetic information. I very much like the idea. I've, I've been very inspired by the idea of information as a commodity, which, as you just described it, can be translated from one medium to another and retains its value, retains right. its meaning um, throughout all these different translations. The similarities and differences between the genetic code and computer code. There's a piece of computer yeah. tape, which is very familiar to me because when I first started uh, computing, um, we did everything on punch paper tape like that. I discovered, I didn't even know that these things existed until uh, maybe a couple of months ago, I started looking this up. I, got so, I was so interested in, in the similarity between these old punch tape computers and the ribosome. It's reading this a lot like messenger RNA. We went over his research into bird songs and animal signaling. In those cases where it is in both of their best interests, then the point we made was that rather than shouting, which is what much of animal signals is about, either literally auditory shouting or visual shouting, bright colors, loud vo voices and so on, you don't need that. If the victim is no longer a victim, but is actually a cooperator, is actually wants to be manipulated, so to speak, then the signal ceases to be a shout and becomes what we called a conspiratorial whisper. And we ended by discussing his unique view of life as an expansion, an explosion of information. He refers to the concept as an information bomb. Here, I'll show you just that final clip of our discussion. The entire interview is posted on the Stated Casually YouTube channel. There is a link to that down in the video description. Without further ado, here is Professor Richard Dawkins discussing his concept of life as an information bomb. In the last chapter of River Out of Eden, um, I had this rather sort of science fiction-y flavored chapter, the information bomb, the replication bomb. And I began with the, the, the analogy with a supernova. Uh, if you look out into the heavens uh, once every century or so, you may see a supernova, a great flare up of um, extreme energy in some part of the solar system. Well, the information bomb is another kind of flare up. It's, mm -hmm. it's not um, visible as a flash of light. Uh, it doesn't become visible until later, but what it is, is the rare discovery, probably rare discovery of replication. On our planet, it happened when the origin of life happened and when RNA, probably RNA and then DNA, anyway, DNA eventually produced um, eat life. And so you've got a, a, a great flowering, an explosion mm. of living things, um, which culminated in humanity, which is capable of actually leaving the home planet, first in the form of radio waves, uh, which have already left the planet, of course, and it could be picked up in this expanding shell, expanding sphere of influence. And then finally, in the form of spaceships, rockets, which can go elsewhere in the universe. Um, so this is like a kind of supernova. It takes longer to develop, but it is a kind of bomb. It's a kind of explosion. It, it has a quieter beginning, uh, but it could have a very momentous ending if, um, as science fiction writers speculate, we do spread to other parts of the cosmos. <laughs> so that's the replication bomb or the information bomb. It starts with the spontaneous arising on a planet somewhere in the universe of self-replication. Self-replication then sets in motion a chain reaction, which is life, natural selection, Darwinian natural selection, no doubt in different forms in different, different planets. But the result is an explosion of life, which culminates in a form of life which is capable of intelligence and capable of, techno capable of technology and is capable of reaching out beyond the home planet, uh, rather like a supernova. I loved that part of this book. It just, I mean, I, I'm sure you're familiar with The Pale Blue Dot, Carl Sagan's uh, yes. poem, you know, where he, he talks about the, the humble earth and how it, it just, it's just a poem about humility. And I was, when I was reading this, your information bomb, I, I, I realized it's actually possible that this, humble pale blue dot could consume the galaxy. I mean, we could actually send out, <laughs> we could actually send out uh, bits of information that first emerged here that go everywhere. 
actually traveling to, to, to is, is, is a, a, stiff, a stiffer proposition. Carl Sagan himself speculated, other science fiction writers have speculated yeah. that it could happen. Um, that's much more difficult than broadcasting radio waves, which we're already right. doing and, and could increase the intensity of those. Yes, it's a, it's a nice science fiction concept. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about our chances of making it to the point to where we could actually get out there very far? It, it's kind of funny because I, I mean, my whole excitement about science and science education, there's a dark side to it where we are, our, our power is increasing exponentially because of science, yet our wisdom to, you know, use it properly is not growing exponentially along with that. I mean, we have the potential with, with virus engineering, all sorts of things. It, it seems almost, uh, yeah, inevitable that something horrible could happen. Yes, the dark side, uh, it, is, it is a worry. And um, uh, I'm, I'm more excited than worried, but... but, yeah. but um, you, 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 but I think you are right to be to be worried. I I believe in science. I, th I think uh, science can be such a force for good. It can be a force for bad as well if it's misused. And the trick, of course, is to use it well. Um, it, it it it's an immensely powerful weapon, which in the the right hands can do enormous amounts of good, and in the wrong hands can do enormous amounts of bad. And and the trick is to keep it out of the wrong hands. The trick is to keep it out of the wrong hands. I think that's a pretty good place to end our conversation, really. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's what science education, I think, really is all about. The more people who understand how these things work, the more minds can comprehend what's going on in these labs and um, in, in different industries, the better our chances are of, of actually keeping this system in check and preventing something horrible from happening. So Richard, I, I really, I appreciate the work that you've done, helping more people understand how this world works, how the scientific process works. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for this short clip. Again, you can see the entire conversation on the Stated Casually YouTube channel. Links can be found in the video description below. Stay curious.